Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for a webinar on the Poison Book Project. I am Daniel Fraser, Library Conservator at the Preservation and Conservation Laboratory, Heritage Library Division, NALIS. We ask you to keep your cameras off and your mics muted, but you are invited to type your questions into the chat for the question and answer segment at the end of this webinar. Let me introduce our organization, the National Library and Information System Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, NALIS, is a country's coordinator of all library and information services. Beyond the Heritage Library, there are over 25 public libraries, three libraries in correctional institutions, libraries in secondary and primary schools, and special libraries in several government agencies all administered by NALIS. Please visit our website, www.nalis.gov.tt for more information about our services. We'll post a link in the chat of this webinar. One of NALIS's key responsibilities is to promote and preserve national heritage information. The Heritage Library Division, located on the second floor of the National Library Building, Port of Spain, Trinidad, helps NALIS fulfill the goal of acquiring, promoting, and preserving national heritage information. Special collections acquired or donated to the Heritage Library Division consist of mainly traditional library items created by or of interest to a significant person or organization of Trinidad and Tobago. I invite you to follow the Heritage Library Division on Facebook at NALIS HLDTT. We'll put the link in the chat. The Preservation and Conservation Laboratory is responsible for ensuring the overall longevity of library materials with attention to the Heritage Library Division and its collection of historical importance. The Park Lab, which was officially commissioned in 2013, helps NALIS fulfill its role as the International Federation of Library Association and Institutions, Preservation and Conservation, or IFLA PAC, Regional Center for the English-Speaking Caribbean. Just recently, NALIS and IFLA signed the new agreement for a further three-year term from November 2021. NALIS is a part of a network of 16 IFLA PAC centers around the globe with the aim of providing knowledge and expert advice on preservation and conservation practices within their region and to serve as IFLA's key area of work on safeguarding and promoting culture and heritage. We've continued our mission of raising awareness of preservation and conservation issues through our preservation webinar series. In case you missed any of our previous webinars, the link to the NALIS YouTube playlist will be posted in the chat. Now, let me introduce our facilitator, Dr. Melissa Tudon. Melissa is a lab head for library material conservation at Winterton Museum, Garden and Library and affiliate associate professor in the Winterton University of Delaware program in art conservation or Woodpack. She currently serves as chair of the American Institute for Conservation's book and paper group and coordinates the HBCU Library Alliance Preservation Internship Program. She's also founding co-chair of the International Bibliotoxology Working Group. Melissa holds a PhD in literary history from Yale University and a MSIS with a focus in library and archives conservation from the University of Texas at Austin. She is passionate about libraries, conservation education and advocacy and health and safety in cultural heritage work. We are so excited to host Melissa as we hear about the Poison Book Project of which she is the lead conservator. So welcome Melissa and it's over to you. Thank you so much, Danielle. <clears throat> I am so happy to be here. I will just share my screen. Can you see my title slide? Yes, we see it. 
Wonderful, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. I will be speaking uh, about a project that I lead along with Dr. Rosie Grayburn, who is the lab head for scientific research and analysis here at Winterthur. Rosie and I, in addition to working at Winterthur, are also uh, faculty members in the Winterthur University of Delaware program in art conservation. And so I would like to share this living land acknowledgement that was developed by the University of Delaware faculty and staff uh, in consultation with Patuxent tribal leadership. The University of Delaware occupies lands vital to the web of life for Lenny Lenape and Nanticoke, who share their ancestry, history, and future in this region. UD has financially benefited from this regional occupation, as well as from indigenous territories that were expropriated through the United States land grant system. European colonizers, and later the United States, forced Nanticoke and Lenni Lenape westward and northward, where they formed nations in present-day Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario, Canada. Others never left their homelands or returned from exile when they could. We express our appreciation for ongoing Indigenous stewardship of the ecologies and traditions of this region, while the harms to Indigenous peoples and their homelands are beyond repair we commit to building right relationships going forward by collaborating with tribal leadership on actionable institutional steps. It's conventional to end a talk with acknowledgements, but in this case, I'd like to begin with them. And that is because the Poison Book Project represents the contributions of a large and growing community of interns, experts, data contributors, funders, health and safety advocates, uh, preservation colleagues, so many people have contributed. And so I am speaking on behalf of what is truly a collective effort. So what is this collective project? The Poison Book Project began as an investigation into 19th century book cloth with two major goals. First, to contribute to the general knowledge about the history of the book, and then also to better inform health and safety practices for people who love, own, and work with books. Commercially successful book cloth was an invention of the 19th century, <clears throat> and it coincides with the industrialization of bookbinding. Book cloth made the selling of bound books as a finished retail product more viable for publishers. And in turn, the rise of retail books popularized cloth bindings among the reading public. Early book cloths were prone to fading and fraying, but as the industry really got underway in the 1840s, manufacturers developed bright, color-fast book cloths that could be beautifully decorated with blind and gold stamp designs, uh, as in the books you see on the screen right now. Book historians have studied book cloth from the perspective of large-scale manufacturing processes, and also from the perspective of the embossed decorative textures that made them such an appealing bookbinding material. However, understanding the actual materiality of book cloth, especially the pigments and dyes that were used, has been a gap in our knowledge. And that is where this book enters the story. This is a second edition of Rustic Adornments for Homes of Taste by Shirley Hibbard that's owned by Winterthur Library. And uh, you can see here that the exterior binding of the book uh, had come detached from the text block, from the printed pages. And it came to the Library Conservation Lab here at Winterthur so that I could treat it. Like many of my colleagues at the time, I happened to be reading a recently published book called Bitten by Witch Fever, which was about arsenic containing pigments in Victorian wallpaper. I know that I am absolutely not the first person to ever wonder if 
bright green book cloth could possibly be pigmented with arsenic based colorants. But I am very fortunate that I work at Winterture, where we have a well equipped scientific research and analysis lab. And my colleague, Dr. Rosie Grayburn, agreed that testing the book was worthwhile. The testing confirmed that the book cloth was, in fact, pigmented with arsenic based emerald green pigment. And that made us realize that we had a lot more work to do. Winter Chair Library holds close to 12,000 decorated cloth publishers bindings, which can be found in both our rare book collection and our circulating collection, where people can check them out and take them home. With the assistance of interns like Leila Huff and Sarah Leonowitz, pictured here, we conducted a random sampling survey of several hundred brightly colored volumes, which we analyzed using X-ray fluorescence or XRF for short. And you can see that's the device that Sarah is using here on the right. It looks like a ray gun. She's pointing it at the book <clears throat> and taking a reading. Whenever we found toxic elements present, we then followed up with a technique called Raman spectroscopy. So XRF identifies elements. Um, in the case of emerald green book cloth, those elements are arsenic and copper. And then Raman can actually identify the specific molecular compound. So where XRF finds arsenic and copper, Raman can tell us that the compound is copper acetoarsenite, which is the chemical term for emerald green pigment. Both of these devices work by generating a spectra, which looks like a line graph. So it's, it doesn't really work the way um, if you watch shows like um, detective shows like NCIS or CSI, which are popular here in the United States. Um, in those shows, you just put a sample into a machine and it magically spits out an answer for you. But in the case of uh, these analytical instruments, you have to compare the spectra that are generated against reference spectra. So you actually have to have some idea of what you're looking at in the first place. Our initial survey turned up a few major toxic elements that really give us cause for concern. And those are arsenic, chromium, lead, and mercury. These are all heavy or transition metals that are toxic to humans. All of these elements are acutely toxic in high doses, meaning uh, that they, they will cause death in high doses but they can also cause chronic health problems with repeated exposure at lower doses. And that's really the major concern of this project. Arsenic is the element that gives us the greatest cause for concern because it is acutely toxic at much lower doses than chromium or lead or mercury. So chrome yellow is the common name for a compound uh, called lead chromate, and that contains both chromium and lead, which are both toxic elements. So chrome yellow is sort of a double whammy here. You can see here a, an image representing a range of colors of book cloths that all contain chrome yellow. So by mixing chrome yellow with other colorants, you can achieve this sort of array going from a deep orange to brighter yellow to olive greens, um, also dark green, as you'll see in a moment. And then even just some sort of rich browns also contain chrome yellow. Chrome yellow is a pigment that became widely available at low prices in the 1880s. So we have found that most of the bright yellow, uh, chrome yellow books, like the one you see here, the second book over the presidents of the United States, those really become more widespread toward the end of the 19th century. In the top row here, you can see book cloth colored with chrome green which is the name for a mix of colorants. It's chrome yellow mixed with Prussian blue. And the color 
can vary depending on what proportions of chrome yellow and Prussian blue are in your mix. So you can see here, most of these are a sort of rich forest green, but there is the fourth book in the row sort of has this brighter, more vivid green. And then here in the bottom row, you can see the color that concerns us the most. This is the bright, vibrant green known as emerald green, which is the arsenic containing pigment. So I'm using the descriptive name emerald green, but the compound that I'm talking about is copper aceto arsenite. This is a compound that has been known by many names uh, throughout its history. Um, you might know it by the name Paris Green, it's one of the most common. And it's also called Schweinfurt Green because that is where it was first commercially produced. It was um, first synthesized around the turn of the 19th century and then Starting in 1814, it began to be produced commercially in Schweinfurt, Bavaria. At the time, and even now, there are some different arsenic-based green pigments that are conflated, so people will use one common name to mean multiple uh, chemical compounds. So you may have heard the term Sheila's green which is actually copper arsenite. So it's similar to emerald green in that it does contain both copper and arsenic, but it is um, technically a different chemical compound. And I'll be using the term emerald green today because that is the term that was first used by the chemists who synthesized it. Um, in comparing Sheila's green, which was um, discovered in the 18th century, Yes, sorry, in the 18th century. Um, Sheila's green is sort of has a more yellowish tone and it's not light fast. So it, it really fades quite readily when exposed to light. Emerald green's appeal in the 19th century was that it's quite light fast, but it is still susceptible to sulfurous air pollution, which can cause it to darken and turn brown. So the light fast emerald green really kicked off this Victorian obsession with bright greens. If you can imagine uh, living in London in the 19th century where um, there's a lot of uh, coal fires and soot in the air and everything was sort of gray and dirty, having products that uh, were colored with this beautiful bright green so reminiscent of nature must have been so appealing. And so this color was used in just a dizzying array of household goods, um, clothing, hats, shoes, children's toys, draperies, packaging, wallpaper, and wall paint. At the same time that Victorian consumers were filling their homes with emerald green products, they were also buying the straight pigment to use as a rat poison and and agricultural insecticide. So there was really a little bit of cognitive dissonance happening there. This cartoon on the left references Sheila's green, but its message applies to emerald green as well. And, um, you know, whenever I'm thinking about these products, I think not only about the people who were buying them, and bringing them into their homes, but also the workers who were making these products. So um, for example, um, we know about workshops where young women would be working in a room that was just filled with emerald green pigment dust floating through the air. They would um, you know, dip decorations for hats into a liquid adhesive and then sprinkle emerald green uh, pigment dust all over it so that um, so that the emerald green would sort of coat the outside of these decorations. And while that was happening, they were inhaling all of this pigment dust and um, getting sick. And then they would go away and recover for a while, and then they would come back to work and just get sick again. So definitely the, um, the health hazards associated with this pigment were known and understood at the time. By the early 1860s, there was a public debate raging about the hazards of emerald green in 
English and American newspapers. Consumer advocacy groups were circulating cautionary tales about accidental poisonings, many of them associated with wallpaper and wall paint in homes. And other groups were concerned that restricting the use of emerald green pigment might harm the British economy. By the 1870s and 1880s, chemists and medical doctors were conducting their own research on domestic products, and they were acting as whistleblowers. There are many historical accounts of accidental poisonings caused by emerald green wallpaper and wall paint, but so far, this is the only recorded case that I've found of poisoning by bookbinding. A book covered in glazed green paper was used by a young boy in Troy, New York as a watercolor palette. So as he licked the tip of his brush, he ingested some of the arsenic from the book cover and was taken violently ill. Thankfully, he did eventually recover. And pictured on the right is the sort of emerald green glazed paper binding that I imagine might have um, been like the book in this incident. This is an 1816 French imprint from the private collection of Ronald Smeltzer, who shared this photograph with me. So, in our research into books covered in emerald green book cloth, we have found certain uh, commonalities. Winterthur's collecting focus is specifically American material culture and its influences, so the majority of our 19th century bindings are British or American imprints, and so that's why I have an asterisk here. Uh, these are the books that we have really been looking into, but it doesn't mean that books published in other countries uh, do not have the possibility of emerald green book cloth. We, we just don't know yet. We haven't collected enough data in those other areas. Based on my historical research, it's my current belief that emerald green book cloth was produced solely in England during the 1850s. We know it was used by English binderies such as Wesley and Company in London, which was a very prolific bindery in the mid 19th century. And it was also exported to North America and possibly other markets as well for use by local bookbinders. This imprint date range of the 1840s to the 1860s is based on our current data set. And so that is also subject subject to change as we continue to collect data for the project. These books are commonly decorated with a blind and or gold stamping, as you can see here in the book on the left. It's about as elaborately decorated as you can get, but you know some of the other books uh, pictured here are a little bit more modest in their decoration. Uh, these books often have gilt edges, but not always. And the book cloth tends to remain a bright, vivid green on the boards, but we see more color variation in the spine area. And so this image on the far right shows sort of that color range of the book cloth on the spines. And as I mentioned earlier, emerald green is susceptible to sulfurous air pollution. And so we think that's why the spines age so differently than the boards of the books, because when a book is sitting on the shelf, it is protected on the sides by its neighbors on the shelf, but the spine is really bearing the brunt of any air pollution. So, as I mentioned, the XRF was able to tell us that arsenic was present. And Raman was able to confirm that the compound we were dealing with was copper aceto arsenite. But what those techniques could not tell us is they couldn't give us a, a true number for how much arsenic is actually present in book cloth. And we really wanted to understand better whether we were being alarmist. Are we just talking about a trace of arsenic or is there quite a lot of arsenic in each of these books? So we took what's called a destructive sample. We cut uh, a piece of book cloth out from under the paste down um, from one of these books. And it's a, 
it's three one centimeter square samples. And we sent those to the soil testing lab at the University of Delaware, where they have uh, the type of equipment that um, they could get some uh, quantitative results for us. We also um, did what's called a pickup test to simulate the handling of these books. So we took a dry cotton pad and a dry cotton swab, and we just lightly rubbed them across the surface uh, of one of these books. And we also sent those to the soil testing lab. And the results really astonished all of us. We found that one average sized emerald green binding contains several times the lethal dose of arsenic for an average sized adult. That's if ingested, which hopefully no one is going to go around eating all the book cloth off their books. But Perhaps even more wor worrisome than that result is that the amount of arsenic that offset on the dry cotton pad and the swab was two to five times the exposure limit set by national agencies for inorganic arsenic. So I want to emphasize that the offset pigment that came off on the cotton pad and the cotton swab was actually not enough to be visible. We didn't see any green smear or anything like that. Nothing was visible on either the cotton pad or the swab. And yet that invisible offset still contained a very high concentration of arsenic. The, the roots of exposure for inorganic arsenic in this context are inhalation, ingestion, and absorption through the skin. So inhalation would be breathing in pigment dust. Um, for example, you might be handling one of these bindings and then you might touch your face, um, you know, rub your nose uh, and inhale those particles that way. Ingestion would be if you were eating or drinking or maybe um, if, uh, biting your fingernails for some reason, um, you know, having that offset get into your mouth and taken into your system in that way. And then inorganic arsenic is not readily absorbed by the skin, but you can have some exposure through that route. And so when we think about uh, exposure to arsenic in this context, we have to keep in mind all of those routes of exposure because what our final exposure is, is the accumulation of all of those different ways that we might take it into our bodies. Inorganic arsenic stays in the body longer than or organic forms of arsenic. So for example, um, if you've seen any of the news headlines over the last five years or so warning about arsenic in brown rice, that's an organic form of arsenic that our bodies are able to process and eliminate much more easily than um, copper acetoarsenite. And chronic exposure to inorganic arsenic is known to cause um, such things as skin lesions, tingling and numbness in the hands and feet, and then without being too graphic, gastrointestinal disorders, liver disorders, cardiovascular disorders, and respiratory disorders. And it has also been linked to lung and liver cancers as well. So how much arsenic does it take to trigger these health problems? First of all, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not really qualified to um, give my opinion on that. But what I can report on is, um, you know, what the exposure limits are that are set by national agencies here in the United States. It is, first of all, my understanding that sensitivity to arsenic can vary from person to person based on body weight, genetic predisposition, and other health conditions. And listed here are uh, safe exposure limits for inorganic arsenic according to various organizations. This is um, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, 
and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, so you can see uh, the exposure limits vary a little bit, but what they have in common is that they are very, very low. We're talking about 10 micrograms per cubic meter of air. So an important question becomes, how do we handle Emerald Green Books in a way that reduces the risks associated with exposure to inorganic arsenic? As adults, we know not to lick books, but children and pets can behave very unpredictably around objects. And so it is crucially important to keep Emerald Green Books away from children and pets. And one way to do that is to restrict their circulation if they're in a library collection. We have actually moved all of the books that we found in our circulating collection that were bound in emerald green cloth into our rare book vault. So those books can no longer be checked out and taken home by patrons. We also recommend wearing nitrile gloves and N95 masks, which we've actually all been doing here uh, as a safety precaution during the pandemic. And it's proved to also be a good safety precaution with, when handling these books. One of the reasons that I think it's a good idea to wear the mask, the mask can help with filtering out some pigment dust. It's not perfect, right? We know those masks don't have a, a perfect seal around our faces, but it's also just a good reminder not to touch your face while you're handling these books. So you would want to avoid touching your face, smoking, biting nails, eating, drinking, any of those things. We also recommend washing hands thoroughly with soap and water, even after wearing gloves. Um, it's also a good idea to avoid soft upholstered surfaces. So thinking about that cotton pad offset, you know, pickup test, you wouldn't want to be, um, you know, holding one of these books on your lap on an upholstered chair. It's better to have them on a flat, hard surface like a table that can be wiped down afterwards with a damp disposable cloth. And then um, I know that this is really a tricky one for a lot of institutions thinking about, do you have access to a waste stream that can handle trace amounts of hazardous waste? At Winterthur, we're fortunate that we have a relationship with the University of Delaware and they have um, you know, an environmental health and safety department that takes care of collecting our hazardous waste as well. I know that's not available to every institution, but I do think that any institution that holds significant collections uh, that could contain these toxic elements really needs to give some thought to what they could do about that. So we also need to think about how to store these books because that book cloth is quite friable, and we know that arsenical pigment dust is shedding. So we knew we wanted to isolate each of these bindings in its own enclosure. And first we thought about the standard enclosures that we use here at Winterthur. So we use Colibri book covers, which are made of polyethylene plastic, which provides a great barrier layer. Um, between skin and arsenical book cloth. And we also use these corrugated clamshell boxes that are pictured on the right. And ultimately we rejected both of these enclosures. In the case of the Colibri covers, they do leave some of the book cloth exposed at the head and tail. And we just felt that there was um, too much of a risk of pigment continuing to shed from those gaps. And then we rejected the paper box for the same reason, that the book cloth could shed pigment unpredictably. It could maybe collect in um, corners of the box, and then it might be released into the air when a patron opens the box or um, could you know, spill out unpredictably uh, when being used. So what we settled on is actually the very humble polyethylene zip top bag. Um, we buy these here um, in three mil and four mil 
polyethylene plastic. And I think uh, either is fine. The important is the important thing is just to make sure the plastic bag is sturdy and has a good seal. And we like these because, um, first of all, they provide a protective barrier uh, between the skin and uh, the arsenical book cloth. And they also signal that something is different um, about these books. We don't store any of the other books in our collection in, in these plastic bags. So it's a visual cue. You can easily see what's inside the bag without opening it. They're easy to label and they keep all of the pigment dust contained. And then as an added bonus, they also provide a barrier in case of a water event. And, you know, in thinking about giving this talk today, I was thinking uh, particularly about the Caribbean climate uh, in Trinidad and Tobago and other countries across the Caribbean. And I know that high humidity is a concern for, for those of you living and working in that climate. And I'm not really sure what that would mean for a sealing uh, a book in a zip top bag like this. I've been thinking maybe um, the seal at the top could be left partially unsealed so there's more air exchange. There is some air exchange even, even if that zip top is sealed completely. But you know, it, it is something to think about. In terms of interventive conservation treatment happening on emerald green books, any sort of intervention that requires manipulation of the book cloth, such as lifting the cloth away from the boards um, or using uh, adhesives, which introduce moisture, both of these things can really increase the risk of higher concentrations of arsenic offsetting. And so for any conservators working on these materials, it's very important to uh, wear all of, the, all of your PPE, your personal protective equipment. So, you know, gloves, lab coat, respirator if you have one. And really the best option would be to work under a certified chemical fume hood. Second best option would be working in a ductless particulate hood that has a HEPA and charcoal filter. But quite honestly, um, we've made the decision at Winterthur not to conduct any interventive treatment on emerald green bindings. We've decided that, um, you know, we will just house them and, um, and label them carefully, but it just doesn't make sense um, to, to do any sort of intervention that involves manipulation of the book cloth because we just don't feel that any singular binding is important enough to put one of our staff members at risk. So at Winterthur, we have tested several techniques for identifying emerald green book cloth, including XRF, Raman, polarized light microscopy. Uh, and we also have colleagues who have successfully detected arsenic using the SSRL at Stanford University. These are all very specialized instruments that require scientific expertise in order to do the analysis and also to interpret the results. And it's honestly very rare for most libraries to have access to this kind of equipment. So we've been continuing to explore other ways of identifying arsenic in books as well. We often get asked by members of the public, is there some kind of test kit I can buy and use at home to tell me if I have arsenic in my book? And the question is both yes and no. So last summer, Woodpack graduate student Jess Ortegon interned at the Scientific Research and Analysis Lab at Winter in order to explore this question of whether an arsenic field test kit could be used to detect arsenic on emerald green book cloth. These field test kits are intended to detect and measure trace amounts of arsenic in drinking water out in the field. You can see here that Jess is wearing full PPE, a lab coat, nitrile gloves, goggles, and a respirator, while also working under a certified chemical fume hood. We took all the precautions we possibly could. 
Now, in order to conduct this test, you first create an arsenic solution from the item that you're testing. And then you mix that solution with acid, which causes um, the arsenic compounds to release arsine gas. And it's this gaseous form of arsenic that can be detected with a microchemical test strip that comes in the kit. As I said, these tests are intended to be used out in the field in open air to detect minute, tiny trace amounts of arsenic in drinking water. A positive test produces arsine gas, which is the most deadly form of arsenic for humans. Symptoms of poisoning appear after inhaling concentrations as low as 0.5 parts per million. So to give you a, a visual analogy of what that means, 0.5 parts per million is the equivalent of a half an inch in a 16 mile stretch. It's a very small amount. So an arsine gas is instantly fatal at 250 parts per million. So my point is just, you would not wanna use this test kit indoors in an unventilated area. I can't actually tell you how much arsine gas was produced when Jess conducted this test because the level was so high that it went off the scale provided with the test kit. So not only did the test, the test produce a really concerning amount of arsine gas, but it also produced quite a lot of contaminated wastewater, which you can see here, 100 milliliters. Um, and this needs to be disposed of properly. It's an environmental hazard. So these test kits are readily available on the internet, but I caution you to please only use them if you have the proper training in handling chemicals and the proper environment to work in and access to a responsible hazardous waste stream. not recommended. So based on our original data set, which was collected both at Winterthur and at the Library of Company in Philadelphia, this is a visual comparison of the occurrences of emerald green cloth bindings versus chrome green cloth bindings. So you can see there's really a spike in popularity for the emerald green bindings in the 1850s, and then later in the century, chrome green really takes over. And here is another histogram based on the 70 books to date that we know to be bound in emerald green book cloth. So you can see that the date distribution is still concentrated in the 1850s and the 1860s with the peak popularity in the mid 1850s. This may continue to change somewhat as we collect more data, but so far we have nearly doubled our original data set and the trend continues to hold true. So if you're thinking about uh, searching in your own collections to see if you might have any emerald green uh, book findings uh, bound in cloth, uh, I would recommend starting in the 1850s and working out for there. However, I would be wary of any book bound in green book cloth because almost all of the green book cloths that we tested that don't contain arsenic do contain both chromium and lead. So honestly, I think it's safest just to be wary of all green uh, cloth bound books uh, published in the 19th century specifically. So, um, you know, we recommend observing handling practices that will help you avoid inhaling or ingesting or absorbing um, any of this material through your skin. And of course, we recommend washing hands thoroughly with soap and water after handling any 19th century binding, because so many of them do also contain lead. I'm actually also going to go a step farther and suggest approaching any 19th century book with bright green components on it with special care. 
Conservators Susan Russick and Carissa Muratori have started looking into emerald green bookbinding papers, such as those pictured here. They have found that these papers were popular in Germany throughout the 19th century as a covering material and were particularly popular in the 1830s and 1840s. And the glazed bookbinding papers tend to present as a lighter, mintier green than the book cloth which tends to be a bit of a, a deeper, more vibrant green. Emerald green pigment has also been detected in um, 19th century end papers on paper spine labels, decorative onlays on the outside of uh, book covers, and also on green text block edges. So if the book was published in the 19th century and it has anything on it that's bright green, please handle it with extra care and caution. We created these color swatch emerald green bookmarks to try to help folks working in institutions that don't have access to analytical instrumentation, uh, just to try to get an idea whether they might have any of these bindings in their own collection. So this bookmark uh, lists characteristics that you might look for and also has images on it um, from our emerald green binding collection, uh, just to help as a bit of a color guide. It's, it's an imperfect tool because it's subjective visual identification, but we have found, um, you know, we've received great feedback from people who have used the bookmark and uh, what we really recommend is sort of using the bookmark to make an original pass through your collections and find likely suspects, and then uh, make contacts with um, other institutions that are able to do instrumental analysis, or in some cases you can hire a private consultant who will come in and perform, for example, XRF analysis that can then confirm whether you're dealing with arsenic or not. Um, to date, we have mailed out uh, around a thousand bookmarks upon request to 42 of the United States and 18 countries around the world. And we are currently uh, revising the bookmarks and we're going to do a second printing soon. So the bookmarks will continue to be available, although right now we're collecting requests on a waiting list. So this is uh, one example of the, the bookmark at work. Our colleagues uh, in nearby Philadelphia at the Philadelphia Athenaeum used the bookmark to identify some books in their collection that they were concerned about. They, um, they picked five books and they brought them up to Winterthur for us to conduct XRF analysis. And we did find that four of the five books that they brought to us do contain emerald green pigment. And the fifth book is loaded with chrome green. So um, we were happy to be able to confirm those findings for the Athenaeum, and we were grateful that they contributed that data to our project. And um, our colleague, Joseph Watson, the preservation manager at Middlebury Special Collections, used the bookmark to identify some likely suspects, and then he was able to follow up uh, using PLM, polarized light microscopy, to confirm emerald green in these bindings, which he then posted on Instagram. The Arsenical Books database is a table on our project wiki page that lists bibliographical information for known 19th century arsenical book bindings. And we update the wiki frequently with project updates. Our initial survey work at Winterthur and the Library Company of Philadelphia turned up 38 emerald green bindings, which worked out to about 10% of the total number of green bindings that we analyzed. Since then, many colleagues at other institutions have joined in on the fun and have searched their own collections for arsenic-containing books and contributed data to our database. So to date on the database, we have 88 emerald green books that contain arsenic 
somewhere on them as some component. So that could be book cloth, paper covers, end papers, labels, or colored text block edges. And as I mentioned early, earlier, um, 70 of those 88 books contain arsenic in the book cloth. Earlier this year, Rosie Grayburn and I established the Bibliotoxicology Working Group, fondly called BibTox. And this is an international cohort of about 30 conservators, scientists, librarians, book historians, and health and safety professionals who are working to develop reliable identification methods for toxic uh, components of historical book bindings and best practices for management of such collections. So please stay tuned for updates as this work continues. Um, we uh, use Instagram using the hashtag Poison Book Project and the hashtag Bibliotoxicology. And we will also be posting some updates on the Wintershire Wiki. And we hope to have our own uh, BibTox website soon. For more information uh, or to request a bookmark, here are ways that you can contact us. So as I mentioned, the book cloth we are current, the bookmark we are currently updating, and uh, we hope to be doing a second printing later this month. But if you send us a request, uh, we will add your contact information to our waiting list and we'll mail out a bookmark as soon as it's available. If you have questions about the project, you're welcome to contact me directly. And um, this is also the link to our Winterture Wiki project page, which I believe the moderators will also drop into the chat as well. So thank you. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so very much, Melissa. Uh, just before we jump to questions, I would like to just quickly share uh, some information regarding our upcoming webinars. We're going to give you a, a bit of a pause before we take questions, and we do have a few in the chat. Feel free to continue entering your questions there if you have more info, more um, questions and would like more information about what was shared. But just to let you know, I hope you join us as we round off our season two of our preservation webinar series. On May 25th, we'll welcome Susan Peckham, Senior Paper Conservator of the Library of Congress, who will provide tips and techniques for the care and handling and storage of iron gall ink documents. Now, this is a very popular ink used up until the early 20th century. So there are a number of documents, letters, manuscripts, ledgers, even artwork that's written in iron gall ink and contained in the libraries and archives throughout the world. So the damaging effects though of the ink corrosion remains a major challenge for preserving these documents. So be sure to join us to find out what we can do with respect to them. And did you know that June 1st is the official start of the Atlantic hurricane season? A disaster plan can help heritage institutions effectively respond to the threat of a hurricane or other disasters. So I hope you're going to join us on June 22nd. Uh, as we give tips for creating a disaster plan for library and archival collections. And on July 20th, we look forward to hearing uh, from Liz Rose, who is a textile conservator of the British Library in the UK, and she shares tips and techniques for caring for textiles. You'd be surprised how many textile elements are contained in library and archival collections beyond just the book clothes that we would have looked at. So careful attention to their handling, their display, their storage is going to be key for their long-term preservation. So we look forward to you joining us for these sessions. Uh, be sure to use the links that we've provided in the chat for more information. So, Melissa, we're going to get to our questions now. Uh, there was a Earlier question, when you were describing uh, sort of some of the characteristics of the books, what is blind stamping? 
and I perhaps, I guess, blind tooling, you know, can you give a, a quick idea as to what someone may look for when they're thinking or hearing of books having blind stamping? Yeah, absolutely. So um, blind stamping is when a, um, a decoration is pressed into the cover, uh, but it doesn't contain any color in it. It's just, um, it's just an impression. Sometimes it looks a little darker and a little shinier than the book cloth on the rest of the book. Um, and then if there were gold laid down in that decoration, we would call that gold stamping. So blind is without any color or gold in it, and gold uh, does contain gold leaf or some other kind of metal foil leaf. Great, thank you so much. And uh, our next question was asking, is there additional research coming regarding the other colors like chrome yellow? So I know the focus here would be on the um, emerald greens, but do you have plans for looking at the additional colors that you sort of referenced at the beginning? Um, yes, um, thank you for that question. And we are actually currently working on the, uh, the chrome yellow pigment. So we are, um, we're analyzing our collection and collecting data for that. And we recently did the same kind of pickup test with the cotton pad and the cotton swab that I showed you for emerald green. We recently did that for um, chrome green and chrome yellow books. And we are anxiously awaiting the, the results of that testing. We have a chrome yellow page up on the wiki and uh, we will be updating that with the results of our quantitative testing as soon as we have that. And uh, after we finish with chrome, uh, chromium and lead, then we'll be moving on to mercury. So we do plan to work our way through the whole rainbow of toxic elements. Yes, I was about to say quite a, quite a colorful uh, project, like someone commenting fascinating, but so very scary at the same time when we think about yes. it. Uh, so wonderful to hear that that research is going to continue. Uh, there were a couple of questions uh, with respect to dealing and handling with it. Um, but just before I get to that, I want to just confirm you said if you wanted to get on the waiting list for the bookmark, and this is one of the questions, how should they go about doing that? Or is there an e-version that we could access in the meantime in order to just see it visually perhaps? We, we don't share an e-version. Um, and the reason for that is because different printers and different computers are calibrated so differently that we would not be able to be sure that the color we were putting out to you is the color that you're receiving. And that's why we actually shoulder the expense ourselves of printing the bookmarks and mailing them out to recipients um, so that we can be sure that we are actually communicating the, the correct color. Um, so if you would like to receive a bookmark, please email reference at winterture.org. Um, and put emerald green bookmark in the subject line, and then just include your name and your postal address. And, um, you know, I would love to hear, when you do that, we love to collect where people heard about the bookmark. So, um, you know, it's helpful for our statistics. So, you know, if you wanted to mention that you attended this talk and that's where you heard about it, that would be very helpful for us, um, for our statistics as well. Excellent. And I know we have a range of users, uh, sorry, a range of participants registered for this webinar. So it'll be quite interesting to hear and get that feedback, Melissa. So thank you so much that your institution is making the bookmark so readily available. We are all anxiously awaiting the second round of printing and when that becomes ready, but uh, thank you for making it so easy for us to get on the waiting list. So question with respect to handling, there was a question earlier on how you, do you dispose um, of any of the toxic things properly? I don't know if you would want to touch on that or touch on the fact that it could vary based on maybe where you're geographical location is and yeah you're absolutely right Danielle it's really based on your geographical location and whether you're an individual or uh, affiliated with an institution 
So um, here we uh, bag up all our trace waste. So all the gloves that we've worn to handle these books, all the damp disposable cloths that we've used to wipe down surfaces that the books have touched, all go into plastic bags that get sealed and labeled that they contain trace amounts of copper acido arsenite. And then those get collected by the Environmental Health and Safety Department from the University of Delaware, and they dispose of them in the university hazardous waste stream. I know that in the United States, many municipalities have hazardous waste disposal that you can contact as an individual um, sometimes places have drop-off locations where you can bring materials like that, but I imagine that this will vary depending on the country you're living in and um, the area within that country that you're living in. Excellent, but there was a question as with respect to the, the book side. So should I discover a book that I believe to be a poisonous book? What should you do? Uh, get some gloves, <laughs> get some nitrile gloves. Um, if you have to handle the book with bare hands, um, please just get it into a plastic bag as quickly as you can and then immediately wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water um, to remove any you know, possible offset that's happened. Um, and then I, I would leave that bag in plastic until you are able to have it tested um, to confirm it. And if you are not able to have it tested, then I would err on the side of caution and just assume that it might contain arsenic and follow all of the safety precautions that, um, that we've been talking about today for arsenical bindings. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. So that answers that question of what do I do? What's the immediate procedure? Should I discover a book that I believe could potentially be a poisonous, a, a poison book? Uh, and I, I should add that you can use um, like the kind of plastic Ziploc bags for food storage. Um, in the immediate, that is a great response. I wouldn't recommend leaving a book in a food storage bag, you know, for years and years because the plastic that they're made from um, will break down over time. Leach plasticizers become brittle. Uh, but in the short term, it's, you know, if it's what you have readily available to you, it's, it's a perfect short term solution. Great. And of course, ideally, I see that uh, at your institution, you guys switch to using uh, the polyethylene mm -hmm. zipped up bags, just given that that's a more stable plastic exactly. than, your, than your commercial sort of zipped up bags, right? But at least in that first instance of, you know, I can't get a hand, a hand on um, any other of those archival materials, at least that first instance, uh, you recommend I isolate. Yeah, I found one of these books at a secondhand bookstore and I popped it into a food storage bag. That was the first thing I did. So. Okay, interesting that you were just at a bookstore and, and uh, there it was sitting on the shelf along with everyone else with its poisonous cell. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's, that's really quite something. There was a question uh, with respect to the type of acid that was used when you did the field test was something was that requiring something really specialized or oh good question i don't remember what kind of acid it was whether it was sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid um but really any any acidic material is going to react with um emerald green and potentially trigger the release of arsene gas also, um, there is a type of mold that actually digests emerald green pigment and releases arsine gas as a byproduct. And so um, in the case of um, all the cases in England of wallpaper making people sick, people weren't licking their oh. wallpaper. They were getting sick because in that damp climate, 
mold was growing on the wallpaper. The mold was digesting the emerald green pigment, releasing arsine gas, and people were breathing that in, you know, while they were sitting in their dining rooms eating, for example. Yeah, thank you so much, Melissa, for answering that. I, I think I, I probably froze with that amazed look on my face as you were describing <laughs> mold, you know, which we encounter uh, relatively often here in the Caribbean, as you can imagine, you mentioned about our high humidity, etc. So the yeah. idea that mold is digesting the book clot and off gassing uh, something toxic beyond it and of itself being toxic. We know of, you know, mold spores and what could happen when you interact with them, but that it was sending off a gas that was toxic. Wow. That's, uh, new libraries that's were amazing. such dangerous places, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know there was one more uh, question. Let me just get to it. Uh, well, maybe it wasn't a question. I think it was more of a, a comment first, um, that it may be really good or cool aspect of this project to have the info as related to some of the titles linked to OCLC WorldCat. Oh, so in that bibliographic info, so that kind of merges, you know, Melissa, you and I train as librarians and conservators, yeah. it kind of merges the two worlds together where the librarian aspect of cataloging info, but then that conservation detail as it relates to this poison book and the toxology related to it. So there was that comment by someone, which I think is just a fantastic idea. Uh, I absolutely love, agree. We, we add this information to our, um, our own OPAC, our, our cataloging data um, in-house, but I, I love that suggestion of um, putting it in OCLC, and I think that is a, a next step that I'm going to have to investigate. So thank you so much for that suggestion. Excellent. And also there was a question if you take donations for the bookmarks. We do. Um, we do take donations. Yeah. On the Winter Tour website, there, there is a, um, a donation page if you want to make an electronic donation. Um, and uh, or, you know, you can mail in a check if, uh, if you like to do it old school oh, that excellent. way. Um, so thank you. That's a, that's a very kind uh, question. Yeah. And uh, just to have you repeat the email address for the bookmark information, um, perhaps if someone was interested in donating for the bookmarks as well as requesting to get on the waiting list, sure. uh, perhaps that will make it really well for anyone wanting to get that further information. Of course, we put the link in our um, chat as well as it relates to the wiki. And uh, yes, Melissa just posted the email address uh, that you can get to and to find that information as well. So I believe we've come to the end of our questions, Melissa. Thank you so very much for this very informative uh, discussion. It was great to hear of its genesis and then how you have been treating with it and then some of the outcome with respect to institutions using your reference bookmark, uh, the future of your research uh, that you're going to make your way through the rainbow of uh, toxic colors. And, um, you know, we look forward definitely to maybe bookmarking the wiki page and sort of staying tuned uh, with respect to some of the updates and things that are happening there. So do you have any final words before we end our session? I just want to say thank you so much for hosting this. It was lovely to be here and thank you to everyone for attending. Great. Thank you so very much, Melissa. Thank you again, everyone, for your participation. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinars. Thank you for your support. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.